Wednesday afternoon, Rip 97.9. Welcome on into Reporter's Notebook. I look at the people, places, and things making news in and around Greene County. Some very interesting folks and an interesting interview we have uh, for this week, Michael. Welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. I always say we're going to be brief, but we do have a very special interview this week, I think. Yeah. And yeah. so I will briefly mention Betty O'Hara, who passed away, and she is an icon in the town of Plattsville. I'll have a little story about Betty this week. I spoke to her family, and they said, yeah, sure, go ahead. An absolute matriarch of the o- O'Hara family. A wonderful picture that they shared of her with a necklace and a, uh, a red dress. A very stately woman. Yeah, and, and her dream was to be a Rockette. So she was a member of the Scary Cloggers, you know, those, that group? Yes. You can hear them dance a mile away. Oh, yeah. Um, So, yeah, Betty was always doing stuff for the town, and it's worth a mention, I guess. Sure. A life well lived. We'll look forward to that. What else is going on in the paper? Well, the usual legislature column. Right. I guess one thing of interest, Joe Charbonneau, you know Joe? He's got a little place over there in Hensonville called the Wyndham Trading Post. Yes, I understand that he had a little opening on Saturday. Were you there? I was. He had a little art opening for a couple of buddies of his, and he told what I think is one of the great stories of all time. So I've written something about that. Oh, good. Well, you know, Joe's a character. There's no other way to put it. He's nonstop. There's no doubt. And when it comes to being on the radio or being in the paper, he'll give you an earful. (laughs) Well, you know, he he built that covered bridge there at the Wyndham Path. Yes. So the man knows what he's doing with woodwork and various other things. An extremely talented gentleman. And wish him well for uh, the future of the trading post. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's going to do with it. It's not like it's open, you know, every day of the week or anything, but he's figuring it out as he goes and just enjoying it. The word trading post maybe implies, you know, buy and sell, that kind of a thing, but it doesn't look like uh, he's starting off in that direction. Looks like he's going to have some artists doing their thing and welcome in the community. Good for him. He's got some pretty cool stuff in there, and we'll see what happens. I mean, like I say, he's just sort of feeling his way as he goes. Well, there's no doubt that uh, Joe Charbonneau is a big Yankee fan. Oh, without a doubt. (laughs) In fact, he had the TV on with the Yankee game on when the show was on. Okay, and memorabilia on the walls, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, the story he told has to do with his mom and the New York Yankees. Oh, cool. So it's a great story. Okay, good. And uh, otherwise, I I say, uh, now, one last thing. Linda Sutton is my neighbor down here. She's married to Tom Sutton. He's a well-known law enforcement guy. Okay. He was named for Outstanding Contribution for a Senior Citizen by Green County. Oh. Which I thought was very nice. Good. So I wanted to give her a shout out. Okay, great. She's a great neighbor. All oh. right, let's get to our special guest. Okay, we will do that here on Reporter's Notebook. Here is uh, Mike Ryan with uh, this week's special guest, and I guess he will introduce him, or Mike will. This was recorded Monday afternoon for Playback at this time on Reporter's Notebook. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jake. I believe we have a a very special guest this week. He is a self-described author and documentarian, Richard Walling. And I'm going to let him describe what he does because this type of research, it would involve genealogy and family history, makes my head spin. So, Mr. Walling, welcome aboard. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you and with your audience. Part of the reason we're talking to you is you have a presentation coming up in Prattsville. On June 18th, which coincides with the Juneteenth New National Holiday, I'll be giving a presentation on the lost Mondor village of Prattville and the Mondor family in the Prattville Roxbury area. They were a very unique family in many regards in that they were originally an African-American family from Connecticut, the Dutchess County, to Margaretville, and by the 1840s, they were in Roxbury and Prattville. Because of the small number of blacks in the area at that time, they intermarried with local white families. Biology took over, and men and women loved men and women, and they intermarried. Over the generations, they became the nucleus of a biracial community in Prattville called Mondor Village. And what's also interesting is the original homestead over in Roxbury on Negro Hill, the homestead site. And the burial ground is still there. Ransom Mondor has a large headstone. But what's not as well known is that there's another homestead site over by Cozy Hollow Road. And that was the farm of a man named Alonzo Mondor and his sister Harriet Mondor Bacon. And the Bacon family still owns that property 170 years later. 
that site also contains a homestead site and a private cemetery. Before we get to the cemetery, we're going to mention the word Negro Hill, and obviously this is no disrespect to anyone. That's just the name of it. It's sort of like the Negro Baseball League. That's what it's called, so that's what we'll call it. But there's no disrespect intended to anyone here with any, any words we use that were used back in those days. Absolutely. For example, the NAACP has a word that some might consider pejorative, but those were the terms in use then and also in use now. So there's no derogatory intent whatsoever. It's just the fact that the families lived there and the hill was named after the fact that there was a black family living in that area. So they're integrated, but they're also not integrated in some way. Well, they are integrated to the extent that they represent a unique story in American history, and that is along the Appalachian frontier, of which the Catskills are a part. There are many bi- and tri-racial groups. For example, there's a group called the Melungeons down near the Cumberland Gap area where Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky come together. Black and white families intermarried. There are the Ramapo Mountain people down near Suffern, New York, and Mawa, New Jersey. Same story. And the Mondors were part of uh, four extended families that had African-American ancestry and European-American ancestry. Obviously, you research this very well. So let's we'll just sort of zigzag through this because, as I, as you said, you're going to give a presentation on June 18th at the Zadok Pratt Museum. So let's get first to the, the cemetery. It took a little while for you to find this cemetery. Tell us that story. I've been researching on the, the family for a couple of years now, and I stopped by the home of a local family that lives just outside of Prattsville. It was an old-timer family. They've been here for generations. And I was mentioning if they had known any of the Mondors who were still living in the area until the 1960s. And the gentleman volunteered that, hey, up on uh, Cozy Hollow Road, there's a cemetery. I had never known that, and the gentleman was very kind enough to put me in contact with Pete Diamond, who also lives in the Prattsville area. He took me on a very adventurous, rough ride up the sides of the mountain, literally over rocks and boulders and streams, and he brought me right to the location of the cemetery. And it's still there to this day, in pristine condition, and about 100 yards away was the foundation of their log cabin, what we would call the homestead site. What's really interesting is the family that owned the property more than 100 years ago, in fact, since 1854, that family still owns it to this day, and their descendants live in Connecticut and in Harlem. Wow, so this is the lost village you're speaking of in Prattsville. Well, the village itself is owned down on Washington Street. These are outliers. This is the farmland, a very rough farmland that people, you know, raised a few cattle on and, and milk cows and, and hogs and so forth. But the village itself was on Washington Street, and that consisted of four homes, both built in frame construction and log cabin construction. And you had the Helicus family, the Bacon family, and the Mondor family. And they all intermarried. A really fascinating part of the story, Mike, is that 10 men of this small community, 10 men all volunteered and served during the American Civil War. When you look at the list of all the Pattsville men who served in the Civil War, and that's available online, you will see that one out of ten men of Prattsville were from this little, small, biracial community. Huh. One in ten men. Okay, now again, we might be zigging and zagging, but it's a lost settlement. Why is it lost, and how did it become lost? It became lost with the passage of time. Like many communities, I originally grew up in New Jersey, and we have these abandoned and lost communities typically associated with bog iron and old forges, say in the Pine Barrens, and up here and elsewhere, where people once lived, once the family members moved away and the properties were sold to others, homes became abandoned, they fell into disrepair or were demolished. In that sense, they're lost to history. But right in that area, there are remnants. Uh, if you look in the woods, for example, there are remnants of some of the old timbers. It's lost to history, but it's not lost in the records. In 1912, when some of the Mondors were selling property up on Washington Street, they referred to that area, that land, as Mondor Village. So it was well known 150 years ago, but 
people aren't alive from 150 years ago. It's pretty interesting. I don't know how you dig through all these things. I've looked at you gave your presentation, and the way you find these records is just incredible. I don't know how you have the patience for it. Well, it's a big jigsaw puzzle. It's detective work. If you you know if you watch shows, whether it's NCIS or Law and Order, I'm dating myself now, <laughs> or you know even more recent shows, just about detective work. It's really finding all the pieces and, and putting them together to, to create a, an entire picture from all the little tiny puzzle pieces. What's also interesting is that the Bacon family, the members of the family who still own the land, as I mentioned, in Connecticut and in Harlem, they've never been back up to Prattville. Hmm. This was property owned by their grandparents and their great-grandparents. So they know they own property in Prattville, but they've never been here. I'll be darned. That's interesting, as you say. Now, we're speaking to Rich Walling, an author and documentarian about sort of a lost village, lost settlement, and it's all about Prattville. Now, we got some interesting cats, so to speak, coming out of this Mondor family, and one of them was written about in the Wyndham Journal in 1873, Alonzo Mondor. Yes, Alonzo Mondor was an older gentleman. Alonzo was born about 1820, and he was living with his sister Harriet. He and Harriet had bought 100 acres of land in 1854, and Alonzo was living with his sister Harriet and her second husband named Proper. And while Alonzo was living with his sister, he started becoming interested in Mr. Proper's daughter, a woman named Anna, about 20 years younger mm -hmm. than Alonzo. And nature and biology being what they are, he and Anna became the parents of a baby, and they married and had about nine children. The last remaining child passed away in 1967, Alfred Mondor. And people still remember Alfred and his brother Leonard and his sister Lena. But Alonzo is very interesting. He basically gave the name of the farmland. It's known as the Alonzo Mondor Farm, even to this day, in the records. And was he a preacher? Alonzo was a self-styled preacher. Which yes. What? He was a preacher. His brother Charles went around gathering money to help in their activities. So he was a self styled preacher. He didn't have a church, but I'm sure he was a very charismatic man. He was a veteran of the American Civil War. He was in his 40s when he joined the Union Army wow. during the Civil War. He, wow. along with his brother Charles and their sons and nephews, all joined, as I said, 10 men from the family joined. And Alonzo passed away in 1899, but before doing that, he sold part of the property to the surviving members of his sister's family, the Bacon family. So Alonzo was quite the character, and that leads into what happened also in the, in the 1890s. Alonzo and his wife Anna, Anna was a, a young white woman, Alonzo's cousin was a man named Henry Mondor. Before we get to Henry Mondor, sure. we're going to change landscape here, aren't we? Are we going across the creek now to Henry? Yeah, yeah we're going across the creek over to the Roxbury, yes. Okay, so we're going to cross the creek, and it's not flooding. We're going to go to Henry Mondor. Go ahead. Okay, so Henry Mondor was born in the 1860s to Jaduthan, and it's like reading names out of the Bible, the Old Testament. But Henry was a young man. Again, he was a farm laborer on his father's farm off of Fanny Brook Road on Negro Hill. And there was a young woman nearby named Katie Klum. Now, the Mondor men and the other men of this extended clan usually intermarried with the local population, which were local white families, and no different with Henry. The problem that Henry faced was that the young woman that fell in love with him was 17 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. Her name was Katie Klum, and her father lived just a couple of farms down from the Mondor farm. Katie and Henry eloped. Ooh. She was 17, he was in his early 30s. They eloped down to the Havistraw area, and then down to North Jersey, but because she was under age, the law got involved. It became national news. A black man eloped with a young white girl, quote unquote girl, when she was 17, and the law went after them. Interestingly, when Henry returned to the Roxbury Prattsville area, he was not arrested. He was not put in jail. There was a hearing held in Prattsville, and that will be talked about at the presentation. And at that hearing, both Katie Klum and Anna Proper Mondor, Alonzo's wife, said what happened about the night that they, they met and decided to, to elope. It's a very interesting story. Needless to say, as soon as she turned 18, 
she and Henry got married and they went on to have a family of their own. And those descendants are still living in our area as well. Oh, no kidding. So this was national news back then, a scandal. It was a scandal because a quote-unquote black man, even though he was, you know, biracial for many generations, ran away with a white girl, quote-unquote, again, and she was 17. The Southern papers, when the Southern newspapers at that time, remember this is the era of Jim Crow in the South, they were scandalized. They were advising their northern brethren what to do and you know, how to handle the situation, which our local residents did not do. They did not take that advice. So that was just life back then, and that's what you do. You tell these stories, and you tell them the way they really happened, to the best of your knowledge. That's the whole thing about history, Mike. A lot of people, as these years go by and the generations pass, history becomes obscured. As I like to say, history becomes memory, memory becomes myth, and a lot of times what we're left with are the myths of the past. I look upon telling these stories is that I'm giving a voice to the men and women who actually lived their lives and who accomplished so much so that their voices are heard and not some obscure mythology that may have grown up since their time. We're speaking with Rich Walling about the lost Mordor village. Let's stray briefly to Harlem Hellfighters and a brief, a brief story about what you just did. Well, on May 23rd, I went down to Camden, New Jersey. A friend of my daughter's is a history teacher in Camden from central New Jersey. She invited me down to Camden, which is a predominantly African-American city, I think the second or third largest city in the state of New Jersey. And I presented on the 20 men from Camden who served in this famous regiment that became known as the Harlem Hellfighters. They originally began as a New York State National Guard regiment. World War I, they became federalized. They served with the French Army because at that time there was not an American division, American black division of soldiers. The Army was segregated then. So they were loaned to the French. They became the most famous regiment of the United States Army during World War I. And they were so well respected by the French and they had won so many battle honors that the French picked them to be the first Allied regiment to enter Germany when Germany surrendered in November of 1918. So I had the fortune to go down to Camden and tell the young men and women about their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers and their contributions that they made to help liberate France during World War I. Now, we could go on all day about these stories. They're all very interesting. I'm going to touch on one more. I'll give you a clue. One of the first references to what became Prattville was a skirmish between British and local militia during the American Revolution. And there was a, a local man involved in that. Yes. So I find this also to be a piece of the puzzle. Right below one of the cemeteries in Prattville, just north of the bridge that goes from one side of the Schoharie to the other side, just north of there, there's a cemetery. Below the cemetery are flats flat land along the river, and during the American Revolution, there was a skirmish there between the local Patriot militia and the British. A British officer was killed during that skirmish. His body was down in the flats, subjected to flooding. A local man, a local African-American man, removed his body, reburied it out of the floodplain. It's fascinating because that man may have been one of the Helicus family members. And the Helicus family comes from the Schoharie area, Schoharie Creek. It's both a white family and a black family. Uh, again, you know, the story of slavery in America and freedom. So the fact that this local black man reburied a British officer shows that there were black members of the community that was to become Prattville. Now, these folks that moved here, they were manumitted, a lot of them. Oh, yes, they were all freed. By the time the Mondors and the other families came to Prattsville, they had been freed for about 40 years. The progenitor of the Mondor family, Joel Mondor, had been a servant to a man named Ezra Reed in Connecticut. Reed moved to Dutchess County, then up to the Catskill area. There's no record that Joel had ever been a slave, but his wife and son, Jaduthan, who I mentioned previously, mm -hmm. they had been slaves. And Jaduthan was born in uh, 1776. So the wife, whose name we don't know, name lost to history, Jaduthan lived in Dutchess County until the 1820s and then moved up to the Margaretville area. And his sons moved to Roxbury and Prattville. And Jaduthin and his mom were manumitted in uh, the 1780s, just after the American Revolution. Wow, it's incredible how you dig this stuff up. Now, lastly, you have a documentary. 
Yes, I'm working on a documentary on the, the Mondor family. I call it the Mondor's family history in black and white. And it just traces the, the history of the Mondor family, touches upon many of the things we've discussed. The purpose of it is to show and to, I hate to use the word educate, but to inform today's Americans and, and people of this generation that American history is 50 shades of gray. It's not black and white. It's many, many subtleties of history. As I mentioned, the Melungeons down in Cumberland Gap, the Ramapo Mountain people. According to a Google search, there are some 200 such mixed race communities across America. Hmm. Wow. Because that's the story of America. You know, we, we're here, we mix, we mingle, and hopefully we become a much better nation as a result. Well, your presentation is June 18th at the Pratt Museum. What time? 1 p.m. And is there a charge for admission? No charge, and folks are welcome to come and participate and ask lots of questions and hope to have a good discussion going. Well, sir, as I said, we could talk about this all day, but uh, Mr. Fink has to play some music, so we appreciate you coming on the air with us, and good luck with your presentation. Thank you very much, Mike. You, you have a great day. Okay. And that puts a lid on another reporter's notebook here at RIP 97.9. Heard every Wednesday afternoon at 3.30. Mike Ryan's guest was Richard Walling, an author and documentarian who will be giving a presentation coming up at the Zadok Pratt Museum on the lost Mondor Village in Prattsville. Be listening next Wednesday for more reporter's notebook. It's here on RIP 97.9 FM.